Dao Jing means the way and its power. The way is the way of nature, and the power is that of the man who gives up ambition and surrenders his whole being to nature. How this is achieved is a subtle mystery. But the Dao Jing suggests that the way of water, the humblest and most irresistible of substances, is something which a wise man should imitate. In the late 20th century, an era of ecology and New Age philosophies, the alternative quality of Daoism has given it considerable appeal in the West. In Chinese history it is indeed alternative, but in a different sense. In the lives of educated Chinese, Daoism has literally alternated with Confucianism. Confucianism and Daoism are like two sides of the same Chinese coin. They are opposite and complementary. They represent town and country, the practical and the spiritual, the rational and the romantic. A Chinese official is a Confucian while he goes about the business of government, if he loses his job, he will retire to the country as a Daoist, but a new offer of employment may rapidly restore his Confucianism. Legalism, from the 4th century BC. Although the Zhou dynasty is the cradle of the two most lasting schools of Chinese thought, Confucianism and Daoism, it is brought to an end by a more brutal philosophy usually described as legalism. Expressed in a work of the 4th century BC, the Book of Lord Shang, it responds to the lawlessness of the age by demanding more teeth for the law. A strict system of rewards and punishments is to be imposed upon society. But the ratio is to be one reward to every nine punishments. Punishment produces force, force produces strength, strength produces awe, awe produces virtue. Virtue has its origin in punishments, proclaims the book of Lord Shang. It is read with attention by the ruler of the Qin. The Qin Dynasty, 221 to 206 BC. By the 4th century BC, the numerous Zhou kingdoms have been reduced by warfare and conquest, to just seven. The most vigorous of these is the Qin Kingdom, occupying the Wei Valley. This region, as when the Zhou were here centuries earlier, is a buffer state between the civilized China of the plains and the barbaric tribal regions in the mountains. The Qin have learned from their tribal neighbors how to fight from the saddle, instead of in the cumbersome war chariots used by the Zhou kingdoms and legalism gives them a healthy disregard for the Confucian pretensions of the more sophisticated kingdoms. In particular they are unimpressed by the claims to preeminence of the feeble state of Zhou. In 256 the Qin overrun Zhou, bringing to an abrupt end a dynasty which has lasted on paper more than 800 years. In the following decades they conquer and annex each of the other five kingdoms. The last is subdued in 221 BC. The whole of central China is now for the first time under a single unified control, in effect creating a Chinese empire. The Qin ruler who has achieved it gives himself an appropriate new title, Shi Huangdi, the first sovereign emperor. His Qin kingdom, pronounced Qin, provides the name which most of the world has used ever since for this whole region of the earth, China. Shi Huangdi rapidly sets in place a dictatorship of uniformity, based on terror. Much use is made of a scale of five standard punishments, branding on the forehead, cutting off the nose, cutting off the feet, castration, and death. The only approved commodities in this empire are items of practical use. These do not include books or Confucians. In 213 BC it is ordered that all books, except those on medicine, agriculture, and divination, are to be burnt. A year later it is reported that 460 Confucian scholars have been executed. The collapse of the first empire, 210 to 206 BC. Like other megalomaniacs, Shi Huangdi predicts that his empire will last almost to eternity. 11,000 generations is his claim. In the event it lasts less than one generation, from 221 to 206 BC. When the emperor dies, in 210, the arrangement of his tomb reflects both his paranoia and his power. In his determination that no thief shall discover and desecrate his resting place, the workmen who construct it are buried with him, or so Chinese tradition has always maintained, adding that the tomb has crossbows permanently cocked to impale any intruder. When the tomb is eventually discovered, 
in 1975, it reveals an even more amazing secret, the famous Terracotta Army of Xi'an. Turmoil follows the death of the Qin Emperor. During it his chief minister, Li Su, receives his own dose of legalist medicine. His downfall is engineered by a palace eunuch, who arranges for him to suffer each of the first four punishments in turn and then, without nose, feet or genitals, to be flogged and cut in two at the waist. A series of peasant rebellions, resulting from the brutality of the regime, accompanies the rapid collapse of the Qin dynasty. From the chaos there emerges the first undeniably great Chinese dynasty, the Han. But the centralizing effort of the Qin ruler does bequeath some lasting benefits to China. The Chinese will never again forget a political ideal deriving from this time, that the natural condition of their great and isolated land mass is to be a single entity. A practical token of this ideal is left by the Qin Emperor in the form of the Great Wall of China, a boundary which securely defines the nation on the only side where nature does not already do so by mountain, jungle, or sea. The Han Dynasty, 206 BC, AD 220. The Han is the first of the five great Chinese dynasties, each of them controlling the entire area of China for a span of several centuries. The others are the Tiang, 7th to 10th centuries, Song, 10th to 13th, Ming, 14th to 17th, and Qing, 17th to 20th. The Han is a great deal earlier than any of these, and it lasts, with one minor interruption, longer than any other. At its peak the imperial power stretches from the Pamir Mountains in the west to Korea in the east and to Vietnam in the south. With justification the Han Dynasty comes to seem a golden age, and the Chinese have often described themselves as the sons of Han. The Han Kingdom was one of the five states engulfed between 230 and 221 BC by the Qin Emperor. During the rebellions which follow his death, the Han throne is seized in 206 by a man of peasant origin. After four years of warfare he is strong enough to claim the Qin Empire. As founder of a great dynasty he is later given the title Kaizai, exalted ancestor. As befits his origins, Kaizai is a rough character, with little respect for the Chinese official classes. The first great Chinese historian, Sima Qian, writing a century later, gives a vivid but improbable glimpse of the man. Whenever a visitor wearing a Confucian hat comes to see the emperor, he immediately snatches the hat from the visitor's head and pisses in it. Confronted by the practical problems of running the empire, Kaizai overcomes his aversion to the Confucians. He even commissions a Confucian work on the principles of good government. And his successors make the Confucians the scholar officials of the state. Under the most powerful of the Han emperors, Wudi, the martial emperor, scholars of other disciplines are banned from court. The Confucian examination system is made a cornerstone of the administrative system. And an imperial academy is set up to study the supposed works of the master, most of them, in reality, written or compiled by his disciples. The Chinese architectural tradition, from the first C. B.C. No architecture survives in China from the early dynasties, with the spectacular exception of the Great Wall, because the Chinese have always built in wood, which decays. On the other hand, wood is easily repaired. When timbers of a wooden structure are replaced and repainted, the building is as good as new, or as good as old. The conservative tendency in Chinese culture means that styles, even in entirely new buildings, seem to have changed little in the 2000 years since the Han Dynasty. Documents of the time suggest that Han imperial architecture is already of a kind familiar today in Beijing's Forbidden City, the vast palace built in the 15th century for the Ming emperors. Carved and painted wooden columns and beams support roofs with elaborate ornamented eaves. The painting of buildings provides ample opportunity for the Chinese love of rank and hierarchy. The Li Qi, a Confucian book of ritual complied in the Han Dynasty, declares that the pillars of the emperor's buildings are red, those of princes are black, those of high officials blue-green, and those of other members of the gentry yellow. Minor improvements are introduced with the advance of technology. 
the colorful ceramic roof tiles of Chinese pavilions are an innovation in the Song dynasty in the 11th century. But in broad terms the civic buildings of China retain their appearance through the ages. A good example is the magnificent Temple of Heaven in Beijing. Its colors, frequently restored, are so fresh that the building looks new. But the structure dates from the early 15th century, in the Ming Dynasty, and its appearance on its marble platform is almost identical to Marco Polo's description of its predecessor in the 13th century.